Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be invited to say a few opening remarks at this celebration of Appcel's 25th anniversary. Um, 25 years ago, when Appcel was first established, I was not part of NUS, but having gone through the history of NUS, I'm aware that at the time there were those who doubted the relevance of environmental law, who questioned whether Appcel was really the kind of way in which the faculty should be investing its research expertise, its resources, and so on. Uh, suffice to say, 25 years later, no one is questioning the relevance of Appcel today. Today, the environment, climate change in particular, is front page news. Alongside COVID-19, it's been dominating the press recently, not least in the form of the IPCC report on climate change, which has been extremely sobering reading uh, and which the uh, UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, called a code red for humanity. The, the full report is more than 3,000 pages long, but key points are that it is unequivocal and an established fact that humans are the cause for warming on the planet, in the atmosphere, the ocean, and the land, and that it is going to be up to humans to address that challenge. Climate change is not the only issue that APSEL has focused on over the years. It's also done enormously important work in building capacity among environmental lawyers in Singapore and across the region and beyond. It's done research into biodiversity, trade in endangered species, pollution, uh, areas like the haze. There are thanks to be due to many stakeholders for the successes of APSEL, but in particular, four people who will be speaking today can really be credited with much of APSEL's success. Firstly, Tommy Coe, uh, known to all as the president of the UN Conference on the Law of the Sea in the early 1980s. He also chaired the PREPCOM and the main committee of the 1992 Earth Summit and has done an enormous amount over the years to support environmental issues, to try and push environmentalism. Uh, and he was one of the driving forces behind APSEL and continues to be involved, co-chairing the advisory committee. If Tommy was one of the driving forces, the drivers themselves are the three women who have led APSEL over its quarter century. Koken Lian, Lai Lin Heng, and Jolene Lin, I'm honored to call my colleagues at NUS. Uh, each have contributed their expertise, their experience, and most importantly, their energy to making APSEL what it is today. So thank you to everyone who's joining us, and thank you in particular to Tommy, Keng Lian, Lin Heng, and Jolene for building APSEL into what it is today. We're looking back, celebrating 25 years, and I, for one, am excited to find out what the next 25 will hold. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Simon, for those very kind words. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to now introduce uh, Ambassador Tommy Ko, who needs no introduction. Um, Ambassador Ko. Uh, Professor Tara Davon, she is also um, the deputy head of the program on ocean law and policy at the Center for International Law at NUS. Uh, Tara is an expert on the law of the sea, and I'm very happy to see that you're also helping Jolene at, at Epsel. Uh, next, I want to thank the Dean, Professor Simon Chesterman, for his uh, welcoming remarks. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate him on the publication of his most recent book with an intriguing title, We the Robots. I would uh, commend this book to all our friends. Please get a copy. Uh, this is a very happy occasion, we mark the 25th anniversary of the founding of Epsel. I remember the saying that when you drink water, you must remember its source. So I want to acknowledge a number of people who have made Epsel possible. I begin with Dr. Pavez Hassan, my good friend in Pakistan, who I think has joined us online. Uh, there would be no Epsil without Pavez Hassan. Following the Earth Summit in 92, Pavez came to see me and persuaded me that NUS Law School is the ideal place to establish a center for environmental law for this bigger Asia Pacific region. The next person I want to acknowledge is the then Dean of the Law School, Professor Chin Tat Yun. Uh, Professor Chin uh, approved the idea to establish Epsel. The next person I want to acknowledge is a very good friend from the UN Environment Program, Mr. Lal Kurukura Surya. Uh, UNEP gave Epsel very strong support in the early days. 
Another old friend who gave us invaluable support is Mr. John Boyd of the Asian Development Bank. I would also like to thank the members of the Pro Tem Committee that led to the establishment of, <clears throat> of EPSEL, and they are Professor Robert Beckman, Professor Lim Lei Ting, and Professor Nick Robinson. Um, I will now introduce our first panelist, Professor Ko King Lin. Uh, King Lin is one of my oldest friends, and we were classmates in the NUS Law School. She is the founding director of EPSEL, a post she held for seven years in recognition of a scholarship in environmental law, the prestigious award, the Elizabeth Hopp Prize was conferred on her. King Lian is also an expert of ASEAN environmental law and policy. And two years ago, uh, one year ago, 2020, she was named the ASEAN environmental lawyer of the year. So it's a very great pleasure, King Lian, to have you join us today and you have the floor. Thank you very much. 25 years of upsell. Before I make my presentation, I would like to show some slides. The first slide shows the launch of upsell on the 1st of July, 1996. This is our logo. And there you can see Dr. Pabes Hassan, Professor Tommy Cole. And it's called the ADB. Upsell IUCN UNEP Capacity Build of Environmental Law. So you can see this is the 1997 mm. batch, 1998 batch. And the materials that were used for the training course were published about five years later. And there were four launches one in Washington, one in Bonn, one in Lahore. And this one is in Singapore. <clears throat> and at that time, we had as guest of honor, the late Dr. Balaji Sadasevan. He was the senior minister of state of the Singapore Ministry for Foreign Affairs. And here's John Boyd. And here is the Michael Avin Chow, one of our members. Here you can see another training course of upsell, we were invited by the Ministry for Foreign Affairs to give a training course to 66 countries. And you can see the flags of the 66 countries. Here are some of the publications. Uh, now, upsell members have ventured beyond the shores of the Asia Pacific region. You can see the whole world, rather. They have gone all over the world to make presentations at conferences and to serve as resource persons. Uh, finally, I would like to just show you the current projects of Upsell and its activities in 2021. If you are interested, you can go to the website, but it is only from 2013 to 2021. I shall now make my presentation. Upsell, 25 years. I pay tribute to Professor Tommy Koh and Dr. Pabes Hassan. Without them and the initial support of the Asian Development Bank, there would have been no upsell. Together, they called to action Agenda 21 Capacity Building to achieve sustainable development. The agenda is an output of the real summit chaired by Professor Tommy Cole. The history of Upsell predates 1996. Hassan obtained an ADB technical assistance grant to fund capacity building in environmental education in the Asia Pacific region. In October of 1992, Hassan and Cole discussed the establishment of a regional center for environmental law to be housed in the Faculty of Law. 
Professor Tommy Coden called me to discuss their proposal with Dean Chin Tet Yoon. The rest is history, a pro tem committee comprising few members of the faculty was established to work with IUCN and represented by Professor Nick Robinson and UNEP, United Nations Environment Program, represented by Lal Kurukura Surya. The pro tem committee members were Robert Beckman, Ko King Lian, Lim Lei Ting, and Lai Lin Hing, joined subsequently by Alan Tan and Simon Tay. Why was capacity building in environmental law so crucial? After the Stockholm Declaration in 1972, an ever increasing number of multilateral environmental agreements were negotiated. Lawyers, legislators, judges, administrators, the private sector, and other environmental stakeholders need to have knowledge of the subject to implement the laws and to tackle environmental challenges. The Agenda 21 concept of capacity building was aimed at strengthening the role of major groups. It envisages three interrelated elements, education, public awareness, and training. The vision of a regional center is premised on the borderless nature of environment. Many environmental problems are transnational. The then current and emerging issues were underlined in Agenda 21 and included natural resource management, fragile ecosystems, conservation of biological diversity, protection of fresh water resources and protection of the oceans. During Upsell's preparatory years from October 1992 to 1995, three initiatives were achieved. First, two environmental causes were included in the law curriculum. Second, a conference on sustainable development of coastal ocean areas was held and its proceedings published. Third, the Protem Committee, IUCN and UNEP started planning the training course on environmental law for professors in the Asia region to take place after the establishment of UPSEL. Now I'll deal with UPSEL's work from 1996 to 2001. The vision of developing capacity building in environment was translated into the objectives of UPSEL very briefly to serve as a regional center, to organize conferences, seminars, etc., to serve as a regional hub for research, to establish and develop a collection of environmental law and policy, to cooperate and collaborate with law schools, institutes, centers, and such other organizations. Since its establishment, Upsell has organized numerous training courses for various stakeholders, including law professors in the region, government officials from various ministries in developing countries across the world, Singapore included, ASEAN judges, lawyers, the private sector, and environmental administrators. Apart from training, Upsell has also organized conferences and seminars covering a wide range of subjects. Examples, illegal trade in wildlife, adaptation to climate change, governance of global cities, food and water security, climate change litigation, and the COVID pandemic. A few words on its flagship project in 1997 and 1998, known as the ADB Upsell IUCN UNEP training course for 63 law professors from 15 countries. A two one-month course was held in 1997 and 1998. It had a multiplier effect. 
For example, some alumni subsequently established environmental centers, environmental law centers, of course, namely the Institute of Environmental and Resource Law in Shanghai Jiao Tung University, Research Institute of Environmental Law in Wuhan University, the Indonesian Center for Environmental Law, the Center for Environmental Law Education, Research and Advocacy in India, and Environmental Law Center in Lahore, Pakistan. As mentioned earlier, another notable training was conducted for the Singapore Ministry of Foreign Affairs in its technical cooperation program. It focused on urban and industrial environmental matters. Over 400 officials from various environmental agencies from 66 developing countries participated over a period of 1999 to 2013. Upsell members also conducted courses and taught abroad and also served as resource persons. A multidisciplinary approach is crucial to tackle environmental laws. Upsell, together with NUS, other NUS faculties, initiated the Master of Science program. And Lin Heng, Lai Lin Heng, Victor Savage, Malone Lee were among those who played a major role. <clears throat> Upsell's achievements and the way forward. Upsell has had a robust 25 years in capacity building in the Asia Pacific region. Some of its alumni members are in high positions. Chief Justice Manso Ali Shah of the Supreme Court of Pakistan is an alumnus of the 1997 TCT course, as is Dr. Mas Santosa, who is on the Indonesian Presidential Task Force to combat illegal fishing. Upsell has been a thought leader. Its over 400 publications include books, monographs, proceedings of conferences, chapters in books, articles, reports, and conference papers. Apart from these, Upsell has also collated materials for the training course. Now, finally, a few thoughts on the way forward. From 1996 to 2010, it laid the foundation for capacity building in the Asia Pacific region. From 2011 onwards, it actively engaged to strengthen the emerging development of environmental law. Um, I shall skip, I've showed you some publications. Moving forward, NUS should consider consolidating upsell and other NUS entities, including the Center of Sustainable Asian Cities, the Energy Studies Institute, the NUS Environment Research Institute of Water Policy and Tropical Science, Marine, tropical, sorry, tropical Marine Science Institute into a NUS hub on environment. So environment under one roof. This will benefit not only these entities, but NUS, the region, and the world. These entities have a vast network across the world and could pull all the expertise together. I would like to end by calling to action the United Nations resolution adopted by the General Assembly on the 25th of September, 2015 entitled Transforming Our World, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development on Revitalizing the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development. The hub is, or whatever name called, if it comes to fruition, will contribute to a greener world for present and future generation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, King Len, for a very comprehensive, uh, good statement. I will now introduce our second speaker, Professor Lai Lin Heng. Professor Lai succeeded Professor Ko King Len as the second director of EPSEL, a post she held for four years. She will also be remembered with admiration as one of the two founding mothers of a highly respected 
master degree in environmental management, the MEM program. Professor Lai also had the honor of teaching for many years at the Yale School of Forestry and Environment, and is admired both here and abroad. Bin Heng, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Tommy Cole. Um, first, I would like to say, um, I'm very grateful to my two teachers, Professor Tommy Cole and Professor Ko King Lian. They did not teach me environmental law because environmental law is a new field. But Professor Tommy Ko taught me in a compulsory course called Administration of Criminal Justice. And Professor Ko King Lian taught me contract law, criminal law, and commercial transactions. Now, as I said, commercial, uh, environmental law is a new field. And uh, I think each of us went into it ourselves. For myself, let me just mention, um, I got into environmental law because of my love for nature. And one of my colleagues in the science faculty, uh, the late uh, Professor Roland Sharma, one day asked me whether I was interested in nature. And I said, yes. And he said, well, we are looking for an advisor to the Nature Society. Can you be our advisor? And I was taken quite by surprise. So um, I said, OK, I will. And I realized I didn't know anything about you know, environmental law. Initially, it was all a question of talk. You know? What do we do when we bring, um, what happens when we bring people on a nature ramble and they get stung by a bee or you know, um, bitten by a snake? So these are taught questions. But later, the questions became more difficult. Oh, we saw people taking birds. What is the law protecting birds? And I realized I didn't know. And so I started and I wrote the first paper on wildlife protection laws in Singapore. And I was very really happy when um, Dr. Pavez Hassan approached us to start EPSA. And I became the deputy director after Robert Beckman. So um, I would like to say that this year, is Epsel's 25th anniversary. And if things were normal, we would actually have a big celebration. It will be the 20th anniversary of the MEM program, the Masters in Environmental Management, and also the 10th anniversary of the Bachelor in Environmental Studies. Because after the success of the MEM program, the NUS provost himself took the initiative of having a multidisciplinary program at the bachelor level, and this was the uh, Bachelor's in Environmental Studies program, jointly co-hosted by the faculties of Arts and Social Sciences and the Faculty of Science. So I will just make one final point about my personal uh, um, involvement. I just want to say that environmental law has really enriched my life. And the MEM program in particular has brought me to meet many wonderful people in the NUS community, as well as abroad, um, particularly the IUCN. And it, you know, I've, I've met uh, some wonderful friends and they remain very, very close friends. Uh, I would like to mention in particular, Professor Nicholas Robinson. He and I co-teach a course on comparative environmental law at Yale, and we've been doing it since I think 2003. Um, we only recently stopped last year when I retired. Right, and of course, um, wonderful friends like Dr. Uh, Professor Donna Craig and Ben Boer. Okay, now I like to, I've been asked to uh, speak on the important developments in international law from 1996, like, you know, from the start of EPSEL. So I will first start to share my screen. Can you all see it? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm just going to do this very quickly because we don't have much time. So I, I've um, categorized this into hard laws, soft laws, and then I want to talk about the IUCN Academy of Laws, uh, of Environmental Laws World Declaration on the Environmental Rule of Law, which I think serves as a good guide for the future. So, Looking first at the substantive laws, we have for pollution, pollution laws, we have the Basel Convention on the Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste. Now, I note that this is 
This was in force in 1989, and it's based on the principle of prior informed consent, or PIC. Now, in 1995, there was a Basel Amendment um, that came into force in December 2019, and it prohibits all export of hazardous waste, including electronic waste, etc., from developed countries, particularly OECD, EU, and Liechtenstein, to non OECD countries. Then I would like to emphasize that Singapore acceded to Basel in 1996, and we have our own law here to implement Basel, this Hazardous Waste Control of Import, Export, and Transit Act. And a special mention about plastics. In May 2019, the Basel Convention was amended to include some types of plastic waste as hazardous waste. I think this is very important because I want to emphasize that the world needs a new convention specifically dealing with plastics. Okay, and I should mention that the Basel uh, Convention system has set up training centers, regional training centers, and in Southeast Asia, this is based in Indonesia. Next, the Rotterdam Convention on Prior Informed Consent, or PIC, put up for signature in 1998, enforced 2004. Okay, so again, this focuses on environmentally sound management of toxic chemicals, including the prevention of illegal traffic in toxic and dangerous products. And uh, base, the, so the, basically, the principle of prior informed consent promotes the open exchange of information. So anyone who wants to export hazardous chemicals must use proper labeling, inform the importing country how to deal with this, etc. And then the parties, and this would include transit countries, can decide whether to allow or ban the importation of these chemicals. Okay? And Singapore is also a party to the Rotterdam Convention. Next, we have the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, or POPs. It's in force in 2004, and it requires parties to take measures to eliminate or reduce the release of POPs into the environment. It's administered by UNEP. The initial 12 POPs called the Dirty Dozen relates to pesticides, industrial chemicals, and their byproducts, and another 16 new chemicals have been added. Singapore is a party as well. So what I want to emphasize is that since 2010, at the meeting in Bali, all three conventions decided that they would meet together because they are interrelated. And if you go into the website, you will see that there are all three conventions are there in the website. Next, the latest convention on um, pollutants is the Minamata Convention on Mercury 2017. And I think we all know what is Minamata disease and it was caused by the release of mercury into industrial wastewater. And Minamata is a city in Japan. So um, finally, they managed to develop a globally legally binding instrument on mercury, it was put up for signature um, in 2013 and enforced in 2017. And again, Singapore is a party. The main provisions are a ban on mercury mines, phasing out of existing mines, and phasing out and phasing down of mercury that's used in a number of products and processes. I think those of us you know, who have got teeth done by the dentist, we actually have mercury in our amalgams. So um, this uh, Minamata Convention also controls measures on emissions to air and releases to land and water and regulates the informal sector of artisanal and small scale gold mining, okay? So next we go into marine pollution and here we have MARPOL. Now MARPOL and its protocol, 1973, 1978, I've listed down the different annexes and since I'm asked to focus on the laws after 1996, I'll draw your attention to Annex 4, the prevention of pollution by sewage from ships that took effect in September 2003, and Annex 6, the prevention of air pollution from ships, 2005. So Singapore has succeeded to all these annexes in MAPOL. Next, um, we have uh, an international convention 
for the control and management of ships' ballast water and sediments. Enforced September 2017. The convention requires all ships to implement a ballast water and sediments management plan. They have to carry a ballast water record book and be required to carry out ballast water management procedures to a given standard. Now, I think you all know what ballast waters are and the damage it can do to the marine environment. Okay, so there are technical standards and guidelines and I'll move on to the next slide. Now, when it comes to nature conservation laws, um, before I talk about the Convention on Biological, Biological Diversity, many um, nature conservation laws were passed before 1996. So I need to mention um, the leading ones would be CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands of International Importance, the um, convention, the uh, CMS convention, the convention on migratory species, and even the convention on desertification. Right, so now I focus on the CBD or the convention on Bio biological diversity that was put up for signature at the Earth Summit in June 1992. And I think everyone knows Professor Tomiko played a leading role at the Earth Summit. So, this came into force very quickly in December 1993, and Singapore has ratified this, okay? So there are just two um, protocols I want to draw your attention to, the Katedina Protocol on, bio on Biosafety and the Nagoya Protocol on Access to Genetic Resources and Fair and Equitable Benefit Sharing, okay? Now we move on to climate change, and actually this is an area for Jolene. Okay, so I will leave it to Jolene, but before I do that, um, let me just talk about um, the Aarhus Convention. Now the Aarhus Convention on access to information, public participation in decision-making and access to justice is not an international convention. It is a regional convention started by the UNECE, the Economic Commission for Europe. And actually, if you look at the parties, they are all European countries. But I think it is very far-sighted. These are important provisions, access to information, sharing of uh, information, public participation, access to justice. And I think parties should be, other countries should be parties to Aarhus. And I want to draw your attention to Article 19, that any other state may accede to the convention, okay? Um, so here, I just want to emphasize that when we talk about international law, it's not just the conventions, but the soft laws, right? So you have the Stockholm Declaration, the Rio Declaration, Agenda 21. How are these principles, like the polluter pace principle, the precautionary principle, common but differentiated responsibilities, intergenerational, intragenerational equity, how, how are these implemented nationally? And if we have time uh, later, I'll talk about how these are implemented in interesting cases in the Asia Pacific region. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linheng. Um, Professor Simon Jasterman said earlier that Epsel uh, has been three, driven by three brilliant women. And it's now my pleasure to introduce the current director. Professor Jolyn Lin. Uh, Jolyn made quite a reputation for herself when she was teaching at Hong Kong University. And we are very pleased that she's come home um, to teach at the law school and also to be director of Excel. Jolyn has uh, made quite a name for herself in the field of climate change and the law. And I invite her to speak to us. Jolyn, please. Thank you very much, Professor Cole, for the kind introduction. So can I just check that you can hear me? Okay, um, I'd like to thank, um, first of all, I'd like to thank a number of people for this, uh, for bringing together the, the Professor Ko, Professor Lai, Professor Tommy Ko and myself to um, share about, uh, to share on this occasion, uh, which is a special one for EPSEL. Uh, before doing that, I also like to extend my personal thanks uh, to uh, the three people in this room who have been 
um, very kind and supportive uh, in my journey in academia. I first met Professor Dr. Tommy Cole actually as a very young student. Uh, I joined NUS only in 2017, but I first met him in 2005 when I had just completed an LLM in international law. And uh, meeting Professor Tommy Cole for the first time was truly an, um, an inspiring moment for me. Um, I met Professor Ko King Lian and Professor Lai when I came back to Singapore to do my diploma in Singapore law, known as the Dipsing. And um, both professors were extremely kind to me and invited me to the environmental law lectures, um, even though I was not allowed to be in those le lectures as I was not enrolled, but I, I really appreciated their generosity and their warmth. Uh, I will now proceed to um, speak to my slides and let me share screen first and then I will be able to. All right. so. Um, I've been asked by the moderator, Professor Tommy Cole, to speak about the future and to discuss how the law could help the world deal with its biggest environmental challenges. I've therefore entitled my presentation, my brief presentation, Our Planet, Our Future, The Role of Law. I've plagiarized this picture. This is the cover page of the IPCC Six Assessment Report Working Group 1's Physical Science Basis Report that was um, confirmed on 6th of August, which was last week. The report makes for some very sobering reading and the UN Secretary General has described it as code red for humanity. Here, I just reproduced two statements, which are the headlight statements of the ISPCC 6 assessment report. It is unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land, widespread and rapid changes in the atmosphere ocean and crystosphere and biosphere have occurred. Secondly, global surface temperature will continue to increase until at least the mid-century under all emission scenarios considered. So it doesn't matter whether we want to, em uh, to cut emissions now, even if we do, even if we have deep cuts now, deep cuts that lead to us meeting the 2050 um, net zero target, we are looking at uh, temperature rises. Global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and 2 degrees Celsius will be exceeded during the 21st century, and unless deep reductions in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases occur in the coming decades. Now, what is the role of law in addressing climate change? First, I begin by looking a little briefly at, the, at international law before I then move to looking at domestic law. The UNFCCC regime, or the, US, the United Nations Framework Convention um, on Climate Change, was, ex, um, was signed and ratified in 1992. And today we have the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. It's widely described as a bottom-up treaty. It rejects top-down legally binding emissions reduction targets, which was what uh, was the um, um, architecture of the uh, preceding treaty, which was the Kyoto Protocol. Many environmentalists lamented the rejection of these legally binding emissions reduction target. It was seen as a failure, a failure of international law to address a critical environmental crisis. However, I'm more of an optimist, I'm more of a realist. The bottom-up agreement is a necessity. It is a necessity, a necessity because it is incredibly dif difficult to bridge the global south, global north divide in environmental politics in the international arena. The bottom-up approach recognizes that we are unable to negotiate really ag aggressive or really environmentally rigorous targets. Instead, we need a different approach. And the Paris Agreement is an experiment in a different approach. It seeks to be an accountability and transparency mechanism. It's the idea, I th at least I think, but the, one of the key ideas behind the Paris Agreement is, is drawn from Harold Cole's notions on the transnational legal process. The Paris Agreement sets up an institutional framework, a regime that allows for repeated participation in a trans -legal, not transnational legal process where various actors, not just states, not just subnational actors, but businesses, philanthropists, civil society, students, activists, 
come together and participate in the important processes in international climate change negotiations to help reconstitute national interests to develop the norms and eventually secure compliance. At the same time, international law provides a framework for reference in the domestic legal systems. The Paris Agreement serves as a, an important reference point, a globally negotiated a glo uh, uh, a reference point for what we need to do, where we need to head, and how we're going to get there. Domestically, what has happened in the context of climate change are three things. First is the promulgation of national laws dealing with climate change, so legislation. And one of the most well-known pieces of legislation would be the UK Climate Change Act, simply because it is the first, and it is admirable because of, of the fact that it compels the governments to set carbon budgets and is guided by an independent scientific committee. Litigation has emerged as a way to secure um, compliance, domestic litigation. And I'll speak a little bit more to that in the coming slides. And finally, climate change is no longer an environmental issue. As environmental lawyers, we are forced to go beyond environmental law. We need to understand how director's duties, for example, can be used to encourage or to compel businesses to take climate change seriously. And I'll turn to speaking a little bit more about climate litigation. I have to confess first, it's because it's my pet topic. Secondly, I do think truly it is a very important trajectory. What we see here in this, on my slide, I have um, taken this um, graph from the latest report on, um, which is the global snapshot on climate litigation um, that is issued annually by the Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics. This report was published in um, July, so that's just a month ago, and it shows a very st steep increase in climate litigation from 2007 onwards. And in fact, there's this, you can call it the golden age of climate litigation from 2017 onwards. There are a number of reasons for that. Two main reasons was that the promulgation, the, the conclusion of the Paris Agreement meant that actors could use the Paris Agreement as a reference point to push for, to you as a, in their litigation strategies. And also in the same year was the groundbreaking case uh, of Prehenda and the, and the Netherlands, where, which was a, the first time an NGO, uh, the first time that a court ruled that a state had to increase its climate ambition or it would fail its people. And, and, and very specifically, it owed a legal obligation to its people to avoid the dangerous effects of climate change. Climate litigation is no longer seen as um, an activist strategy that is, is, is launched by a couple of, 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 of tree huggers. It is an advocacy strategy. It's a strategic, uh, it's, a, it's known as a regulatory strategy. In other words, the term strategic climate litigation is, is now regularly used. It's not just a global North phenomenon. Some people think that climate litigation is a luxury to be engaged in the US or in Australia or the European Union. That is um, not true um, in the sense that we have climate litigation across the world in Africa, Asia, the Pacific, and Latin America. In Asia, climate litigation has occurred or is occurring in China, India, Pakistan, the Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. In other words, it is not an isolated phenomenon. What is climate litigation and why is it interesting? It's a, for, it's a way to compel governments to enforce environmental laws and to uh, and or to raise their climate ambition. It is also now being used to send the message to companies that ignoring climate change is a business risk. I'd like to take this opportunity to just briefly introduce some notable cases. I begin with one of the most high profile cases of 2021, Milieu de Fancy and Royal Dutch Seychelles, popularly known as the Dutch 
case, the shell case. Um, well, so in a very in a nutshell, um, the big corporate uh, actor here, which was uh, Shell, one of the biggest um, um, players in the fossil fuel industry, um, lost in this case, which was brought by a group of NGOs led by Milieu Defensi, which is the Dutch branch of the Friends of the Earth. In this case, the the Hague District Court held that Shell needed to increase its climate ambition and it was required to cut its greenhouse gas emissions across scope one, scope two, and scope three to its to 2019 levels by 2030. When this case um, uh, when, when, when the case was, uh, when the news of this case, uh, of this um, uh, judgment was released, it caused, you know, it, it was such a, it was, it was, it was considered groundbreaking. Why was it groundbreaking? Because it was the first time that a court said explicitly what a fossil fuel company would have to do and that a fossil fuel company owed a legal obligation to cut its emissions. Lahari in Pakistan, uh, it's a well-known case decided by Judge Mansur Ali Shah, who is um, well-known as one of the um, uh, um, judges trained by Epsel, and who is a close friend, a good friend of Professor Ko King Lian and Professor Lai Lin Heng. Um, and I, pro I probably have no time to speak about the other cases, but let me just um, move on from here then. I mentioned briefly just now, but one of the things that is notable about climate litigation today, and I think it's a, a marks a broader trend in environmental law and governance, is that we're looking beyond environmental law to address environmental issues. So for example, we see cases being brought against companies for misleading advertising because they have, in, in other words, greenwashing. Um, Another notable thing is looking at how, uh, here I want to bring attention to a very interesting development in Singapore law. Um, a, few, a couple of months earlier, um, the legal opinion on directors' responsibilities and climate change under Singapore law was um, released. It was um, penned by a senior counsel, one of our most notable senior counsels, Jeffrey Chan, and uh, some of our colleagues here at the law school. And what this, 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 what this opinion um, drew attention to is that directors in Singapore have to bear in mind that they, fa they potentially face legal liability if they do not address or take climate change um, into account in their decision making. Here I want to take them, I will just conclude my presentation by um, quoting from um, Judge Mansur Ali Shah. This is um, one of his uh, notable climate uh, judgments, I would say notable climate judgments, uh, which was issued a few months earlier. And I think it captures the spirit of judicial activism um, that is um, spearheading climate litigation, but also is I think an attribute to the type of great work that um, has been done in this field. This court should be mindful that its decisions also adjudicate upon the rights of the future generations of this country. It is important to question ourselves how will the future generations look back on us and what legacy we leave for them. This court and the courts around the world have a role to play in reducing the effects of climate change for our generation and the generations to come. Through our pen and the jurisdictional threat, we need to decolonize our future generations from the wrath of climate change by upholding climate justice at all times. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, we will now move to moderated Q&A uh, session, um, moderated by Ambassador Ko. If anyone would like to ask any questions, please feel free either to raise your hand and I will uh, point you out or to use the uh, chat function um, and I will help Prof Ko with the questions. Perhaps while we are waiting for the questions, um, I thought I should just say a few words, yes, right? Yes. So I think as, as Professor Jolene Lin has made clear, you know, from international law, you still have to implement it at the local level, right? And here I want to share 
um, some of the wonderful cases that have emerged from the Asia Pacific region. And you know, the, they, they were really right on the ball and it was in the 1980s and 1990s. So if I may share uh, this with the audience, the first principle, of course, as lawyers, we try and see whether there's something in the constitution relating to the environment. That helps it, you know. So if you're an environmental lawyer, you want to see whether the constitution gives you the constitution gives you protection. So um, in India and the Philippines, they have very clear provisions in the constitution. So if I may quote the Indian constitution, there's a duty of every citizen to protect and improve the natural environment, including forests, lakes, rivers, and to take care of wildlife. And this is the part I like, to have compassion for all living creatures in their constitution. And there's a duty on the state to protect and improve the environment and safeguard the forests and wildlife. And the Supreme Court has been extremely creative, you know, and this was in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, there is a very, very um, excellent environmental lawyer called MC Murta who brought a lot of cases. And if I can mention, you know, the Supreme Court has actually ordered tanneries to close down, made them, you know, required them to build treatment plants, compensate the villagers, ordered cinemas, radio stations, schools, universities to have programs on the environment in the media, you know, and they applied the concept of the public trust. And I think this is a very interesting concept that lawyers have developed, you know, the view that um, the state holds the properties, uh, including forests and biodiversity, anything that's not in private ownership is held on a public trust for the people. And because the beneficiaries are members of the public, they have the right to be consulted. And that's, this brings in the concept of the environmental impact assessment as well. So yeah. interesting. Thank it's you. really, really Thank interesting. You, you know, you. there's- Tara has- oh, Okay, yes. and let's go. Mm -hmm. Oh, Nilifa. Okay, here I am. <laughs> Greetings. <laughs> it, it's a remarkable milestone, 25 years, but really with the visionaries here, starting with Professor Tommy Coe, everyone here, my dear friends, really, uh, Professor Lai, uh, Professor uh, Kang, and Tara, and Jolene, it's fantastic. Uh, to see you all and celebrate this moment. Um, I have a question and it has to do that we, one point we all have in common beyond, uh, in addition to our uh, commitment to environmental law is education. So where is environmental law in the curriculum of law schools? Do you feel that um, environmental law is being given adequate importance in the curricula. Should this change? Uh, is it mandatory in classes? Should it be? How are we going to educate this generation who, frankly, they're the ones who are going to be suffering? We see that now. There is not one report that has a positive message to give, starting from the IPBS report in 2019 uh, on, on the loss of biodiversity, and now the Code Red for Humanity for Climate Change. So I'm just wondering whether as educators, whether educational institutions are doing enough. And I will stop there because I know there are many other questions. Uh, thank you, Nilufan. Thank you for joining us from Istanbul. Um, is Simon Chesterman still with us? He will be the ideal person to respond to you. Are we doing enough on environmental law education? Um, Simon, no. are you with us? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, I, I think it's a great question. We're engaged in a curriculum review, and one of the challenges in a law school curriculum, any kind of curriculum, is what you make compulsory, what you incentivize students to do. Uh, so no, I think it would be an uphill battle to make environmental law a compulsory module for all students at a, at a large scale. Uh, but I think the point you raise, the point that comes out of the, the IPCC report, is that climate change is not just a matter for environmental law now. It's a matter for corporate law, increasingly looking at ESG. Uh, it's a matter for tort law, as came up in, uh, in Jolene's presentation. It's a matter for 
constitutional law that comes up in the standing questions that um, that Lin Heng was talking about. Uh, so this is a, it's partly a defense that it's, it's hard to add things to the curriculum, uh, but I think the pervasive effect of climate change in particular, but the importance of environmental law in general means that it will infuse the curriculum naturally, uh, not necessarily in a good way, it'll, it'll pose all sorts of problems, but I think it will be impossible for a law graduate to be ignorant of environmental law in one form or other uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. Uh, thank, thank you. Would anybody else like to comment? Uh, King Lin, sir? Right. I think that is an excellent question. I have quite often thought of making it compulsory for the first year. Well, I'm going to suggest something which is very radical. In the first year of the law curriculum, we have actually three compulsory subjects, torts, contract, there are foundation courses, and criminal law. I was just wondering, instead of criminal law and make criminal law an elective course, why not make environmental law a compulsory course in the first year? Now, I know the three subjects are the traditional subjects for all law schools. Supposing that's not possible, then is it possible for us to run a series of environmental law lectures and make it compulsory attendance for first year students or for law students. When I was studying at the Institute des Études Internationales in Geneva, we were required to attend compulsory courses. So we did have our own courses, we had to write a thesis, but apart from that, everyone had to attend. It's not examinable, and I think that would be one solution. Thank you. Thank you, oh, thank you King Lin. Any other comment? Okay. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. It was very informative. Um, I am an Australian law student, and I just had um, a question. I'm not sure if um, I can ask anyone or to a specific person, but uh, for the Paris Agreement, I understand that it is a very important step towards the direction of few um, long term um, climate targets. Um, but I was just um, curious about the NDCs, uh, the nationally determined contributions under Paris Agreement, how they are kind of like the voluntary commitments for the country, uh, for the member states, where they can set their own uh, targets. How would that help in reaching the net, uh, you know, net zero target by 2050? I think if I would summarize the question, it would be whether what is the pub, how do we achieve how do we secure compliance with the NDCs? Um, if there is no compliance or if a country fails to achieve its NDC, are there any um, consequences? Are there any penalties? And the short answer is no, uh, in the sense of the traditional legal penalties that one would assume. Um, and I think that is why we, we you know, the Paris Agreement is, is described as a, by political scientists mostly, that is a non-legal voluntary agreement um, because it doesn't really have the kind of um, architecture that one would typically associate with a multilateral environmental agreement where there is a compliance committee and there are um, consequences. But let me just take a step back and say, so what if there were consequences? When it came to the end of the first period, for, uh, first compliance period for the Kyoto Protocol, Canada was, it was clear to Canada that they would not be able to meet their reduction targets because they had been so heavily invested in tar sands at that time. Everyone knows that in international law, a state has the freedom to enter and exit any environment, any treaty. Therefore, Canada choose, chose to exit the treaty. There were no consequences as a result. There was a very sophisticated compliance uh, mechanism that would be kicked in under the Kyoto Protocol for a country that failed to meet its targets. But by choosing to exit the, 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 the treaty altogether, there, there, was no, there was no way for the Kyoto Protocol or the UNFCCC um, secretariat could even um, sanction Canada. 
All this means is that ultimately, when it comes to environmental issues, one of the key challenges of international, international law is that sanctions are not going to really go very far because it is ultimately a fundamental um, aspect of international law that you could exit a treaty. So um, I think we have to rethink the way these NDCs work. They are meant to be a public declaration and, and, and it depends on many stakeholders to hold nations accountable to fulfilling their NDCs. And the failure to do so um, would include being seen as a pariah, you know, and most, it is assumed that most nations would like to be seen as compliant with international law rather than being a pariah. And there are many other channels for securing um, compliance through, for example, uh, NGO um, shining a light on what uh, nations are doing, etc. cetera. Tara, can you hear me about um, you know, climate change? Yeah, and biodiversity um, conservation uh, actions. And the reason is there is so much emphasis now, a lot of publicity on climate change and people ignore biodiversity loss, but they're so intricately interlinked. And in fact, biodiversity conservation solutions can help ameliorate climate change, but not all climate change solutions are good for biodiversity loss. And the second point following on from what Jolene said, and that is it needs to be bottom up. And so what is the best unit for action? Cities. My third point, and they're all interrelated. And the third point with regards to education, the key thing is there is a lot of interest now in biodiversity, climate change, and finance and businesses. There is so much happening that it's amazing. I've been tracking them. So you have banks who are now talking about being ethical about giving loans. Insurance companies worry about the effects of climate change. And thirdly, the finance sector, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is coming up with rules and regulations, sustainability report and all that. So I think we need to actually tie everything together and address biodiversity loss and climate change together with law, with ethics, with education. So it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. Thank you. I would be good if the panelists could comment on that. Thank you. First of all, Lena, um, I should mention Lena is an advisor to Epsel. She's from the National Parks Board. So thank you very much, Lena, for your question. Um, I fully agree that uh, we need to look at this. Right now, I think um, for my course in environmental law, I have um, someone who's a working attorney talking about giving a seminar on green finance. Now we need to link this. And I think it's very, very important that we bring in ethics, you see? Because we need, first of all, for soft laws in terms of ethics, we have the World Charter for Nature and the Earth Charter, right? The other thing we need to also bring in at the local level, uh, on a, each person has to take responsibility. And I think what we have not really looked at is try to educate also or bring in people from the religious community. Every religion has its perspective on the environment, you know, and the religious leaders can play an important role. So we ought to strengthen this, right, by including them. So I, and, and coming to education, I fully agree that education has to start from the very beginning, from the little kids, when you inspire the kids to care and love for nature. It's a lifelong thing. Thank you, thank you. Um, as we are running out of time, Tara, can we listen to all the questions? 
and then I'll ask the three panelists to respond okay. in a composite way to them. No problem. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I can ask then Burton maybe to ask it because he's had his hand up for a long time. Burton, can you ask your question, please? You Hi, everyone. Um, Hi, Hi, congrats, everyone. Um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, give a special shout out to the uh, attendees of this uh, event, uh, who are our current and former law students uh, from the faculty. Um, um, uh, simply because I think, um, as has already been mentioned, um, I think one of the key themes for environmental law and an Absol story in general has been this idea of um, intergen intergenerational um, uh, reaching across in, re reaching across generations, right? And and I think that's something that's quite clear um, um, from my own experience. I mean, both King Lin and Lin Heng were my teachers, and they inspired me uh, into the field. And I hope that uh, we will continue doing this uh, with our current and, and future students as well. Uh, and that's why I think. Um, uh, the Environmental Law Students Association that was set up, you know, by Absel a few years ago, uh, is something that we should really uh, throw our support behind as far as possible. In fact, this year I've been told um, your guest is here somewhere. Maybe she can give the details. Um, they had a record sign up of fifty of the students uh, from the freshman class uh, who are interested, uh, who know nothing about environmental law, <laughs> but are interested in the subject. So I hope that um, that's something that more resources can be put into uh, and and um, I, I just think that um, that's that's the way forward because you know with this code rate report that's coming out uh, until unless this becomes uh, a topic where there is uh, real knowledge and, and, and expertise uh, at all levels going down to our, our students um, it's going to be very hard uh, for real change to be effective thanks. Okay, um, I, we have a lot of questions and I don't think we're going to have time to go through them all, but perhaps um, I can take three questions or four questions. I think we have 12. <laughs> okay, um, there is one question. Yeah. Sorry, oh, Ben, ben yeah. Yes, sir. thank you very much. Um, the, the question to Jolene is a somewhat narrow one. I wanted to just say something uh, a little bit more broad uh, in relation to the presentations. Um, I was present at the opening of APSEL in 1995, 26 years ago, when everybody was uh, very keen and, and uh, much younger. But I'm pleased to say, say that we're um, still as keen now as we were then. What I wanted to say was, uh, Lin Heng mentioned Professor Nicholas Robinson, um, and um, I wanted to mention particularly that APSEL and the training programs in 96, 97 were the beginning of the IUCN Academy of Environmental Law. That's when that discussion started uh, with Nick Robinson, with me and with other people uh, sitting around thinking through what needed to be done. So I think APSEL can be very proud of the fact uh, that it was the, the initiator of those particular discussions, because now the IUCN Academy is still going many years later uh, with over 200 institutions around the world, uh, very vibrantly discussing progress with environmental law. So thank you very much for this opportunity to say that. Okay, um, I, well, I'll just read three questions out um, from Linda, our senior research fellow. What do you think APSEL's role in the future for the region and for international environmental law? That's one question. And um, I wanted the other question about ASEAN, if you just give me a second. Uh, given that many of our environmental problems are transnational in nature, what role can ASEAN play in addressing such borderless environmental problems? Um, and I think, uh, I think that is probably all we have time for, given that we have- Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe King Lin can answer the question about ASEAN. Huh? Well, wait, hold on. I'm going to go around and ask the three panelists to make a remarks for a couple of minutes so we can close this on time. I begin in reverse order with, uh, with Jolene. 
Thank you, Prof. Cole. Um, I'm just going to briefly answer some of the questions that, um, okay, so on climate litigation, there were a couple of questions about whether this golden age is going to last and what it means. Uh, first, I think that there's going to be more and more cases because there was going to be a mimic cry effect, a lot of uh, inspired by the successful cases, more and more actors will try to bring cases as to whether they are successful or not. Um, is another question. Um, someone asked whether we are seeing um, litigation, uh, climate change litigation extended to other avenues of dispute resolution. Um, yes, we are seeing that, especially investor state arbitration. Um, and um, that's, that's been a, an, a mediation. Um, I think I'll just take a few minutes to just thank um, um, everyone for joining us. It's been very interesting. I'm, I'm sorry we cannot do justice to the number of questions <coughs> in the chat. And also the, the nature of these events makes it very challenging because we are not um, you know, able to be dynamic. I've been told that I should not run over to Tara and speak to her without a mask. It's very naughty. <laughs> so I will now hand over the floor to the next. Okay, right. um, I'll follow the footsteps of Professor Tommy Cole in making three points. <laughs> first of all, I want to make the first point, which is that there's no magic in laws, you know. Laws are just something on paper. Whether they work or not depends on a lot of other uh, uh, um, uh, avenues and, and circumstances. And here I want to talk about the need for a good environmental management system, an EMS. You can have the best water pollution laws, but if you don't have modern sanitation, people are going to defecate into the lakes and the rivers. So you need to build modern sanitation. Then the next question is, where's the money coming from? You're a poor country, you know, but there are companies who are prepared to invest. It's their business, but they will only invest if there is respect for the rule of law in that country. So, you know, that's where the law comes in again. See, so that's my first point. Next. I like to advance this principle, especially for members of the judiciary, the, the, the um, environmental law professors at the IUCN Academy, etc. You know, and its connection with also the World Declaration on Environmental Rule of Law. There's pushing this principle called indubio pro natura, which stands for, in case of doubt, decide in favor of nature. And I think we really have to implement this. You know, and, and this question of also educating our judiciary, you know, so um, to what extent, right? So the next point, the final point I want to make is in the context of Singapore, what are the inadequacies in our laws? The most glaring one, we don't have a law mandating EIAs, Environmental Impact Assessment. Right now, it's got a bit better because um, mm -hmm. National uh, uh, Ministry of National Development has now issued biodiversity conservation guidelines for an EIA, but that's too narrow. We need a good EIA law, and I believe Tommy has written on that as well. And also, we don't have enough laws on waste management. It still has to be better. So those are my three points. Thank you. Kaylin, you have the last word. Right. Could you, I'll just could make you, yeah, one go ahead. point. Yes, I'll just make one point. Future of upsell, of course, it's not for me to say what the future is or should, what upsell should do is for the current director and future directors. But I want to remind ourselves why upsell was established. It was the vision of the founders and the name Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law was not given in vain. It was the whole of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and so one of the visions was translated into the objectives, and that is to cooperate, collaborate with law schools, institutes, centers, and other organizations. And environment being borderless, of course, as I showed you the map, it is beyond the Asia Pacific region. So if we could be reminded of the vision of the founders of the name Asia Pacific, is not physically Singapore or just a few countries, but the whole of Asia Pacific and the whole world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, King Len. Um, over to you, Tara. Okay, no, I think uh, that's the um, I think that is the, comes to the end of our um, 
a fireside chat. Actually, we've had a few celebrations or seminars this year uh, celebrating AppCell's uh, 25 years in existence. Um, the first three uh, related to corporations and sustainability. Um, we will have more uh, webinars uh, closer to the end of the year celebrating uh, this wonderful milestone of, of AppCell being in existence for 25 years. Um, and I would like to thank you so much to our uh, participants for their active engagement. Uh, we wish we could have answered all the questions, but unfortunately did not have time. And uh, without further ado, I will say uh, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to Professor Cole. And okay, thank you very much. Happy birthday, Absol. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.